One of the most challenging things to understand about the evolution of species is that if species are going to change over time and evolve into new species, one of the most important aspects of an organism's life cycle is actually going to have to be impacted in most cases, and that's development. Now, development is a very complex process, and in this video, I'm not going to get into the details of development. Instead, what I'm going to talk to you about today is how we can look at changes to the developmental process and also look at things that don't change in the developmental process among species and use that to help us understand the evolutionary relationships and the evolutionary past of the species themselves. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. One of the first things I mentioned in one of my first videos about evolution, what it is and what it isn't, uh, was that individuals don't evolve, they develop. And that's true of all individuals. Development refers to the changes that occur within an individual uh, from the point of fertilization up until they essentially reach adulthood and then eventually die. And one of the things that we can all understand from a, a human perspective is what human development looks like. We begin first as, as a zygote, we become an embryo, and then eventually a fetus inside the womb, and then we're born as a newborn. We then progress through our, our, our various developmental stages, becoming a toddler, and then a, and then a child, a young adult, teenager, or adolescent, uh, and then into adulthood and move on from there. This process more or less occurs in every single different species, although it may look different, and in many cases it occurs much faster than it does uh, in human beings. But the bottom line is this, for each individual species, that developmental patterning is pretty stable uh, and it's pretty consistent. But what's interesting is in order for species to adapt and over time change and evolve into new species, this developmental programming is going to have to change. Now the problem with changing development is that development is a process that you really shouldn't mess with all that much. And we can actually see that in pretty much all species that certain changes to development aren't very well tolerated uh, and they often result in some type of birth defect, genetic abnormality, or even in many cases, uh, premature death uh, of the individual who possesses those mutations. But nevertheless, in order for evolution to occur, developmental processes are going to have to change. Now, one of the things that can be very informative to us from a developmental perspective or from an evolutionary perspective is looking at the developmental patterns of various species and looking at where they're similar and where they're different. So let's start by examining just the animal kingdom because we have a lot of information about that. Plus, I think it's something that we can all kind of relate to. We understand animals. When we look at the animal kingdom, we actually can observe uh, that there are a lot of things that all animals have in common in terms of their development. So first, almost all animal species are sexually reproducing. So we'll talk about this from a sexually a sexual reproduction process. All animals, from the simplest sponge up through the most complex uh, bilaterian, animals that have bilateral symmetry, um, have, undergo the process of fertilization. A sperm needs to find an egg. But what's very interesting is when we look at these different species, when we look at sponges or nadarians or what we call bilaterians, we can see that there are some differences even at the very early stages. So the first thing that's going to happen after fertilization is you're going to end up, those two cells are going to fuse and you're going to end up with a diploid zygote. That single cell is going to begin replicating very quickly, a process known as cleavage. It's going to replicate through mitosis until it reaches about a, a ball that consists of about 100 cells uh, with a sort of yolk filling in the center. So it's a hollow ball with a yolk filling. This is called, a, uh, this is called, uh, this is called bl uh, the blastula. Okay. Now, it's at this point where we're actually going to see a differentiation between these species. The thing to know about these three species, or three groups of species, I should say, first is this. If you're a sponge, you actually have no distinct tissue layers. You have differentiated cells, which is a requirement for being considered multicellular, but you don't have distinct tissues. If you're an adarian, so that's jellyfish, hydra, uh, sea anemones, uh, things like that, uh, things with tentacles that sting, basically, uh, you are considered to be a diploblast. Uh, you have radial symmetry and you have two germ layers, an ectoderm and an endoderm. The ectoderm is the outside layer. The endoderm is the inside layer. And the reason why you're gelatinous and squishy is because in between those is something called a mesoglia, which is sort of a gelatinous secretion that comes from uh, both the, the endo and the ectoderm. However, if you are a bilaterally symmetric animal, which is most of 
uh, of animal life, uh, you are considered to be a triploblast. You actually have three germ layers. You have the endoderm and the ectoderm that both, uh, I'm sorry, that the that the uh, nadarians have, but you also have a middle layer known as the mesoderm. This first difference is actually going to occur right here because at about that 100 cell stage, an event called gastrulation is going to occur. And those cells are actually going to differentiate into the ectoderm and the endoderm, regardless of what species you are, as long as you're not a sponge. And in the case of the triploblasts, you're going to end up also getting them to differentiate into mesoderm cells. Now, up until that point, it's completely conserved. But at this point, we're going to start seeing some differences. But here's another conserved step. Regardless of whether you're uh, a, a diploblast or a triploblast, that particular blastopore is actually going to fold in on itself. It's going to invaginate and it's going to form a hollow tube structure. That tube is going to go on to become the alimentary canal, basically the digestive tube of those cells. And that is completely conserved depending on what, whether, regardless of whether you are a diploblast or a triploblast. But there's actually another branch point in life that occurs right here. And it's what that initial opening is going to become. If you are a diploblast or if you're most triploblasts, that initial opening that's going to form is going to become your mouth. That's what you're going to eat through. However, if you are echinoderms, which are starfish, for example, or you are a chordate, so us and all other vertebrates, uh, for example, that opening actually becomes your anus and you are known as a deuterostome. So those who form the mouth are known as protostomes. Those who that hole will eventually become to form the anus are known as deuterostomes. So there's actually a branch point in life too. So what you can see early on is there are already things that all life had or all animal life conserves as part of their developmental patterning. But you can also see that there are, are some differences there. In fact, there are differences even within a subgroup of that. And it's these types of comparisons that are actually used by taxonomists to help classify life together. It's because both echinoderms and chordates are deuterostomes. That's exactly why they're lumped together as the two most closely related animal species, uh, as opposed to any of the other groups, which actually go on to form the mouth from their alimentary, from that initial opening of the alimentary canal. Now, after this gastrulation stage, these cells are going to continue to divide, but they're also going to start differentiating. So uh, those ectoderm cells are eventually going to give rise to the outer layer, the outer surface layer of the animal uh, skin. In most cases, it'll also help to go on to produce the nervous system. Uh, the endoderm is going to go on to form the, that produce the cells that form the lining of the gut. It's also going to go on to produce several different internal organs uh, in, in many cases. Um, and it's, it, it's important in doing that. And if you have a mesoderm, like the us bilaterians have, us triploblasts have, uh, those mesoderm cells will go on to give rise to things like bones, some other internal organs, blood, and tissues such as that. Now, how is this process controlled? And this is the really interesting part about development. It doesn't work the way we're comfortable thinking about in complex processes actually working. As human beings, we are very, very familiar with something known as top-down architecture. We are familiar because most of our systems work through a top-down mechanism. What I mean by top-down is this. You start with a central plan, and then that plan is executed by other people underneath it. This is how our government works. This is how the military works. This is how most corporate organizations work. So, for example, you, if you're in the military, you've got the generals that form the plan, and then the generals tell the colonels what's going to happen, and so on and so forth down the chain of command, and you end up with this big war plan, and everybody's doing their own thing. A great analogy for this is in architecture. If you're going to build a building, uh, say you're going to build a house, well, first you start with the architects. And the architects are going to develop the blueprint for that. They'll pass the blueprint off to the engineers. Then the engineers are going to go off and they're going to hire uh, the masons and the framers and the carpenters and the plumbers and all the people that are needed to build that house until the house is eventually built. It's top down. You start with a single plan and then everything works off of that. Unfortunately, uh, for our brain's sake, that is not how development works in living things. Living things use bottom-up architecture. In other words, each cell is kind of doing its own thing during the development process, and by doing its own thing, it influences nearby cells. Let me explain it to you a different way. If you've ever watched a group of birds, a flock of birds, uh, swarm, and you can see they exhibit this very tight pattern of movement through the air, you may be tempted to think that there's one bird that's kind of calling all of the shots and there's some sort of choreographed dance that they're doing. 
but it's not. There is no bird in charge. And what's actually happening is each one of those hundreds or thousands of birds that are part of that flock is simply responding to what the bird right next to it's doing. So if the bird right next to it just kind of swerves to the right, then the bird next to it's going to swerve to the right, and the bird next to that one's going to swerve to the right, and the bird behind it's going to swerve to the right, and essentially they all just swerve to the right. That's actually how development occurs in living systems. If you remember, I had a video a while back about uh, different types of cell-to-cell -cell signaling, and we talked about how there could be this big type of hormonal signaling called endocrine signaling, but that's not actually what regulates development. Development's actually mainly regulated through paracrine signaling, and paracrine signaling occurs by nearby cells. And that's what starts to happen in a developing organism. Local interactions between cells actually begin to dictate what the cells around them are doing. And this is actually dictated by a small host of genes that are active in some cells and active in not. And over time, those cells begin to differentiate and take on different responsibilities. They may produce certain signals that other cells don't. They may produce certain receptors that allow them to respond to certain signals that other cells won't. They kind of exist in their own little microenvironment, and that's what's actually happening as these cells of the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm begin to differentiate. These cells go off and create their own little environments. So why is that important? Well, it's actually important for understanding how very small changes in a very select few groups of genes can actually have a huge impact on the, on the development of an individual. One particular protein that's very, very important for developmental timing is called Wnt, W-N-T. Now, Wnt is important for several aspects of the, of the bilateral body plan. First off, it's important for, uh, for anterior-posterior polarization, so where the head's going to be versus where the tail's going to be. So it orients the body that way. It's also important for, for controlling um, cell, cell migration, so certain cells need to move throughout the body during the developmental process, and Wnt can influence that. Wnt can, Wnt can also influence cell reproduction. It can encourage cells to actually reproduce, to produce more cells in a given area. Therefore, if Wnt is absent, those cells don't multiply as high. Here's a great example of where Wnt is expressed. And you can see that it's actually expressed with, through this, look at this dark colorization. You can actually see that uh, Wnt is expressed in a very, very small subset of cells at one particular part of the organism. And you can see that that particular part of the organism is actually developing into the head. Now let's look at an example where they've mutated the expression pattern of Wnt and Wnt is kind of not localized as it should be. What you start to see is this particular developmental timing and the patterning starts to rapidly fall apart, resulting in, uh, in an individual that just frankly isn't compatible with life and would eventually just not go on to be born. This is the impact that Wnt proteins can have. Now what you're kind of looking at here is, is something that we know. Um, messing with these key proteins that are involved in developmental timing and spatiotemporal patterning isn't a great idea. And you know anything that really hinders the ability of these proteins to function is likely not to be compatible with life. It's a very bad thing. But remember that there are all kinds of different mutations that can happen, and if it happens to occur at the right time, in the right way, in the right environment, something that seems really bad could actually be kind of be good. Another classic example of, of looking at genes that regulate developmental patterning are the Hox genes. Um, I've talked about them in several videos. Uh, Hox genes have undergone several rounds of gene duplication, and they're very, very important for the, uh, the spatiotemporal patterning of which ge developmental genes are active and when. What's interesting is when we look at very simple animals, when we look at nadarians with their two germ layers, sponges with their no germ layers, uh, we don't see uh, a, a lot of, of Hox genes. I think sponges have one and nadarians have two. But when you start to get into more complex bilateral animals with, uh, with three germ layers, with uh, segmentation and complex body plans, you see that these animals actually possess sometimes dozens of different Hox genes. And these Hox genes are actually located in very distinct parts of the body. And they've also undergone specialization or subfunctionalization or neo-functionalization to actually be able to perform very distinct functions. So whereas a Hox gene in an Adarian controls a huge subset of genes that are important for developmental patterning, Hox genes in, for example, a human being may only control a few aspects of the developmental timing. Why is this important? Well, one, it means that a mutation in a single Hox gene might not produce such a huge effect that it would render this, the individual completely unlikely to be born, which might make it better tolerated. But it also means that small tweaks in these Hox genes can have very subtle tweaks on the organism as a whole.
Now, this isn't always the case. Uh, several different mutations have been introduced into these genes to study what they do uh, in fruit flies and zebrafish and, and, and frogs and, and, there are, and, and salamanders. And uh, there are some pretty uh, horrific effects. Uh, for example, uh, there's a particular uh, mutation in fruit flies that causes them to produce two sets of wings. Uh, you, there are mutations in salamanders that uh, cause them to be born with like eight different legs. And of course, these types of gross abnormalities aren't likely to be compatible with life. But, you know, what you can see is that very subtle mutations might not have quite that pronounced of an effect and that under the right conditions, it might not be a bad thing to have two sets of wings if you uh, are a fruit flyer or something like that. And that over time, subtle changes to these developmental genes can cause mutations that change the overall developmental patterning of individuals. Now, one of the really interesting things that comes out of development is when we actually compare the developmental patterning of various species. What's often interesting is that we can see when we look at the changes that are in the developmental patterning of certain species, we can actually see what similarities they have and what differences they have. And we can begin to learn about the evolutionary history of these species. So for example, if we look at vertebrates and just superficially look at what vertebrate embryos and fetuses actually look like, it doesn't matter whether you're a human or a chicken or a frog or a fish, at some point, we all look very, very similar. And the reason is simple. The earliest stages of developmental patterning are identical. All vertebrates are going to have uh, several key characteristics, ranging from a notochord uh, to a dorsal hollow nerve cord to gill slits. Now, over time, what's going to happen is that developmental time, that patterning, that developmental process is going to change that allows those species to eventually you know, develop into their own unique species. But in doing so, it leaves evidence of their ancestral past. So for example, if we look at all vertebrates, they're actually all going to start out by having a tail. Now, do all vertebrate species have a tail? No, we don't. Frogs don't, gorillas don't have a tail. What happens to them? Well, eventually they dissolve. So why do we have a tail during our development at all? Well, it's simple. All vertebrates have a post-anal tail. It's just a feature that all of them have. We're also all, you know, at some point in development have these gill arches or gill slits. Now, if you're a fish, those will actually go on to maturation and those gills will be what you use to actually, you know, breathe underwater for the remainder of your life. If you're an amphibian, you actually retain those gills for a little bit as well. Remember, if you're a frog, for example, part you actually come out of your egg as a tadpole, which is essentially a fish. I mean, look at a tadpole. It's basically a fish. And then the remainder of the development, including the development of the tetrapod limbs, the shortening of the tail and the development of lungs actually occurs afterwards, which is interesting. Those of us who are mammals like us, birds and, and, and reptiles, all that process is going to happen inside of our amniotic egg, uh, which brings us to another difference that we actually see in, in vertebrates. While reptiles and, and birds and mammals all have uh, all have amniotic eggs, birds and reptiles, those eggs are actually going to be laid and for the most part and actually hatch outside of the mother. If you're a mammal, on the other hand, you're going to retain that amniotic egg. It's going to grow inside the mom and then the mom is going to give birth to live young, which she will then uh, feed using her breast milk. The point being is when we go back and look through all of the all of the, the developmental processes, we can actually start to see where the changes occur, but we can also see which parts of the developmental programming are not changed. And what we see with development is that development can't change all that much. And the other thing we see with evolution in general is that evolution doesn't allow for the creation of new things or new processes. When a frog, when a frog evolved into existence, it couldn't go back and just say, oh, I can just skip that whole part about, you know, having a tail. I don't need that. It couldn't. It just had to find a way to sort of overwrite that programming. It's the same thing with humans. We can't go back and be like, uh, please don't give me a tail and please don't give me fur. I don't need those things. I'm not going to have fur when, when, when I'm born. Nevertheless, at various points in your, in your field development, you have both a tail and fur that just happens to go away. Uh, those of us that don't have gills, we can't just go back and say, I really don't want those gill slits and go through the process of sewing them up. Sorry, they're there. Evolution does not allow for, the, for, for, for us to erase, in any case, our ancestral past. It's there. It just gets overwritten. And you kind of have to think of, of, of living beings through evolution almost being like a file or a disk that just gets saved over and over again. You, you never really get rid of all the parts that were there before. You save over it, but some of the original information changes. We're just 
sort of an edit on existing programs. That's kind of how species evolve over time. One of the coolest examples comes from the existence of three different sets uh, of kidneys uh, that exist in vertebrates. So uh, when all vertebrates go through the process of development, they're going to develop these relatively simple rudimentary kidneys that are rapidly going to go away. Unless you're a very primitive aquatic vertebrate like a lancet or something like that. They actually retain those kidneys and those are the kidneys that they use. Now, most of the rest of uh, vertebrates are actually going to get rid of those kidneys and they're going to end up having uh, the kidneys that uh, fish and amphibians have during their adulthood. However, reptiles, birds, and humans, or, or mammals, I should say, are going to also rapidly degrade those kidneys and develop a third set of kidneys that are exactly those found in adult reptiles, birds, and, and mammals. Again, this is one of those classic examples of if you're going to say that species are specially created, then why, any, why in the world would you go through this process of giving them these kidneys, then these kidneys, then finally the final kidneys that you're going to get? And why do those kidneys that they have that get rid of, why do they look exactly like the ones that amphibians and fish have in the first place? It's simple. The evolutionary process that created mammals and reptiles and birds went fish to amphibian to reptile and then from reptiles to mammals and birds. It's just simple and it's so it's just right there in our development. So one of the big takeaways I want you to guys you guys to have about development is you know developmental patterning ha is is hard to change. But it has to change in order for species to evolve. Particularly when we're talking about the evolution of higher taxa like going from amphibians to reptiles or reptiles to mammals and birds. But the evidence for those changes is right there. It's literally written right in our own development and you can actually see the changes that our ancestors went through to evolve the body plans that we have today. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, we talked about development and what we can learn about evolutionary pasts from, uh, from looking at the development of various species and how development can change over evolutionary time. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you'll tune into my, tune into my future videos. I appreciate your time. Talk to you soon. Bye.